And now I would like to introduce today's special guest. Our speaker today, Dr. David Naylor, has one of the most important jobs that exist in our society. As the president of Canada's leading university, the University of Toronto, Dr. Naylor is responsible for helping to shape the young minds of the women and men who are expected to be Canada's leaders of tomorrow. And these future leaders are entering an economy which is a demanding one. We only need to look at the phenomenal growth of countries like China and India, and we see how quickly the world has changed in the last 20 years and will continue to change. At the individual level, it is no longer enough to enter the workforce armed only with a positive attitude and a will to work hard. You need skills and you need knowledge. It is the same story at the society level. The future belongs to those countries who train the best and the brightest. It belongs to those whose young people are best prepared for a rapidly changing world where innovation in a wide range of disciplines is the key to success. When he became president of the University of Toronto just over a year ago, Dr. Neela had this to say about the future in his installation address, and I quote, we shall need all our creativity and innovation and all our intellectual firepower from multiple disciplines with a transnational perspective if we are to confront successfully the many challenges that face us on this earth. I'm not sure which challenges Dr. Neela is going to highlight, but I will hazard a guess that he may touch on some of the economic challenges facing our country. So let me just touch on two of these related to the global economy. Looking just at the Asia-Pacific region for a moment, it is important to note that the middle class in China and India is perhaps 15 times larger than the population of Canada. That's a lot of buying power and something that we haven't yet capitalized enough on. As to university graduates, China alone graduate, graduated 644,000 engineers in 2004. That's three times the number in the United States in the same period, and I dare say significantly more than three times the number who graduated in Canada in 2004. This brings us to the topic of Dr. Naylor's speech today, which is the skills gap that exists in this country today, and one that we must close if we're going to enhance our international competitiveness in an increasing multipolar world. And we will hear from Dr. Naylor that gap is not just the responsibility of our universities, Governments and industries have roles to play as well, and he's here today to talk to us about what he believes needs to be done and how. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our podium today the President of the University of Toronto, Dr. David Naylor. Thank you very much, Noella, for that generous and very apt introduction. I was feeling pretty relaxed about this speech, notwithstanding a substantial viral load, and then I learned about, as Noella said, the next Canadian club address, and I thought I was completely outdone. Special artisanal cheese and beer tasting. How can I compete with that? But I am nonetheless delighted to be here today and grateful to the Canadian club for this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. And I'm also humbled to speak on behalf of an institution whose history for 179 years has been woven into the fabric of our great urban region, our province, and our nation. More than a million University of Toronto graduates have gone on to help build our country up to its present stature. Today, the university has 11,000 employees. We spend about $1.7 billion per year serving over 65,000 students, 7,000 of whom are international. And we're busy not only sharing knowledge, but creating new knowledge. Based on total publication output compiled in the computerized indices published by Thompson ISI, the University of Toronto generates more research than any other publicly funded university in the world. And if you add in the very wealthy private universities to the south of us, only Harvard publishes more than the University of Toronto. It's obviously been a long journey for what began as King's College in the town of York, a small university chartered originally to fill a colonial and provincial vacuum. 
But in this afternoon's remarks, I want to look not back, but around and forward and talk to you about what I believe is a critical moment in the evolution of Ontario and Canadian society. It's a platitude to assert that a new knowledge economy is sweeping the world. The message is so banal it's already fashionable to discount it. The all-Canadian contrarians already grumble. Aren't we the top performing economy in the G8? What's wrong with a resource-based economy that plays to our natural advantages? Why shouldn't we be hewers of softwood and drawers of oil? We have great mineral wealth. Who cares if the head offices sit in Europe or South America, so long as the companies make more jobs for Canadians? Anyway, the contrarians say we have other time-honored advantages. Compared to the U.S., we manufacture cars efficiently because we have a well-educated and stable workforce that receives publicly subsidized health care. Isn't that enough? And the answer is no. No and no. In fact, for the long haul, it's nowhere near enough. By all means, let us have a thriving resource-based economy. Let's celebrate a Canadian success like Barrick, the world's top gold producer, turning things upside down with Canadians in charge of mineral resources elsewhere. And by all means, let us compete ruthlessly to lure Japanese or American auto manufacturing concerns to Canada. But I am talking about our national asset mix. A responsible diversification of our portfolio of economic activities so that Canada can claim a very serious share, a disproportionate share, of knowledge-based global industries. That change in our economic base is surely vital if future Canadians are to enjoy sustainable prosperity and if there is to be more balanced development across the various regions of this sprawling dominion. Consider for a minute how we fare in global brand names compared to other nations with small populations. Sweden, with a population of 10 million, has Saab and Volvo, Ericsson, Ikea, Tetra Pak, and AstraZeneca. South Korea, a nation occupied and devastated in the early 1940s and then split by a civil war, has Hyundai and Kia, Samsung and LG. And yes, we do have our own innovation success stories. At the moment, Research in Motion, RIM, is our best poster child of that class. Here's hoping its run is long and strong. But Canada's drive toward a bigger stake in the knowledge-based global economy may already be stalling out. Ranking the overall economic performance of nations, of course, is about as precise as ranking universities or colleges. <laughs> but certain indicators and rankings keep triangulating in some unsettling ways. One of the latest is a report released in September by the World Economic Forum. And in it, Canada fell in business competitiveness from 14th to 15th, while in global competitiveness, we went from 13th to 16th. Not a trend line that's very encouraging. I suggest to you, in laying the foundations for a knowledge-based economy, this country has unfinished business, an urgent need to think through the strategies, investments, and incentives that will change our economic framework fundamentally. And in the rest of these remarks, I want to focus specifically on where institutions of higher education and especially where research-intensive universities fit into this bigger picture. A decade ago, a Liberal government in Ottawa launched a national innovation agenda that saw a major expansion of government investment in R&D, together with efforts to align incentives more favorably for industry in some respects. And we're waiting with anticipation now to see how the new Conservative government will it put its stamp on a research agenda for Canada. Believe me, we need to get moving because each month we are losing more ground. Noella Milne shared some statistics with you. Let me give you others. China plans to build 100 new universities over the next decade. More than 5 million new students enrolled in Chinese higher education institutions last year, up almost fivefold over the enrollments in 1998. I know that some observers remain confident don't worry, they say. Their engineers and scientists aren't very good. Right. Between 1997 and 2004, the Chinese output of articles in international science journals grew at least fourfold, and the number of patents issued to Chinese researchers grew almost 
fold. R&D spending in China has been growing at an annual rate of about 17 percent, far higher than the 4 to 5 percent annual growth rates reported for the U.S., Japan, and the European Union over the past dozen years. In the interest of time, I won't even get started on India. Meanwhile, our great neighbor to the south has awakened to the threat to its R&D dominance. Earlier this year, President George Bush tabled a budget for 2007 that requested a total of $137 billion for federal R&D. My best estimate is that federal R&D spending per capita in the USA is and will remain at least twice as high as Canada for the foreseeable future. And the language surrounding these American investments is telling. I know about those electoral results and I know about Canadian attitudes, but listen to what George Bush said in February. And I quote, my 2007 budget recognizes the importance of innovation to our economic future, fostering and encouraging all the components that make our economic engine the envy of the world. In partnership with the private sector, state and local governments and colleges and universities, the American Competitiveness Initiative will promote new levels of educational achievement and economic productivity. With the right policies, we will maintain America's competitive edge. We will create more jobs and we will improve the quality of life and standard of living for generations to come. Let me highlight another point about these new American investments in R&D. They are unabashedly oriented to supporting fundamental research, not applied and incremental research, however valuable that may be but the paradigm-shattering and disruptive discoveries that flow to first-class research institutions. In fact, Bush referred specifically, and I quote, to high-leverage, innovation-enabling fundamental research designed to underpin and complement shorter-term research performed by the private sector, end of quote. We all know the old axiom, necessity is the mother of invention. In truth, I would put it to you that it is the other way around. Invention is the mother of necessity. Here in the audience today is Professor John Polanyi, who won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry at the University of Toronto in 1986. When John Polanyi started studying infrared chemiluminescence almost 50 years ago, no one could have imagined the eventual application of lasers in everything from CD players to medical devices today. Fundamental research has always had unexpected impacts on society, whether in the humanities, the social sciences, or the sciences. And among those unpredictable impacts are changes in the way we understand different cultures and societies, highly successful spin-off companies, or even the birth of whole new sectors of the knowledge-based economy. Those impacts aren't automatic. Today in Canada, we need partnerships with industry and we need some careful investments by the federal and provincial governments in two dimensions of commercialization. The first is in what I'll call translational research facilities, initiatives that will take university-based research just a few steps closer to the marketplace. Those steps can help transform a set of discoveries from theoretical intellectual property sold to a U.S. firm at bargain basement prices into job-creating made-in-Canada companies. The second set of investments, as many in the audience will understand, is much trickier. We still need to figure out the incentives and disincentives that affect Canadian entrepreneurship and find a way to facilitate seed stage investments that will spawn new knowledge-based enterprises. Let me emphasize again that when we talk about a knowledge-based economy, we must look beyond science and technology. The social sciences and the humanities, including the creative and the performing arts, are also an integral part of that new economy. They make a huge difference to our quality of life, and they help all of us to understand and navigate this complex and shrinking world. The arts and entertainment sector, in particular, is a wonderfully green job creator, be it in film production, animation, music, or other outputs from our cultural industries. Considering all these different ways the Canadians have been and can continue to be creative, 
One critical fact jumps off the page. The main output of research universities is not patents or spin-off companies. It's people. Ingenious people hardwired for creativity and innovation. People who will be able to engage with the rapid pace of global knowledge creation. Mike Lazaridis, the co-CEO of RIM, has repeatedly made this point. Dr. Lazaridis argues that patents for disruptive technologies can sometimes be developed in the product laboratories of truly innovative companies. But the right mindset to generate those patents can only be developed in the research and teaching laboratories of fine universities. And the same arguably can be said for the creative impulse in a wide range of activities cutting across knowledge-based industries, including arts and entertainment. In this regard, investment in higher education gives the U.S. an ongoing advantage over Canada in economic competitiveness, not Nobel Prizes or research competitiveness, but in ability to train and educate leaders for businesses and for professions. In 2003, American universities awarded 19 times more master's degrees and 12 times more doctoral degrees than Canadian universities, despite having only nine times as many people in the 25 to 34 year old cohort. A 2004 report from Canada's Institute for Competitiveness and Prosperity estimated that in Ontario, the loss from our education gap was $907 per capita. Now, if that's accurate, we're talking about a national loss in excess of $30 billion per annum. Clearly, higher education is an investment with phenomenal economic leverage, and yet somehow we keep thinking of colleges and universities exclusively as cost centers with benefits that accrue primarily to individuals. In that regard, I do want to compliment Premier Dalton McGuinty Minister Chris Bentley for their investment in graduate education in Ontario. Over the next two years, as many as 14,000 new masters and PhD candidates will be enrolled in the Ontario post-secondary system. This is important and it is welcome. In lockstep, I strongly urge the federal government to support a major suite of graduate scholarships that would help the next generation of young Canadians to pursue advanced degrees. Let us put those funds not in the hands of the provinces, where they can be used to offset other investments, and not in the hands of institutions on some formulaic basis. Let's do something un-Canadian. Let the best students apply, let the best students win, and let them go wherever in Canada their ambitions take them. The same need, incidentally, arises for international graduate scholarships. You know, this country actually has one of the world's greatest comparative economic advantages. Our ability to embrace talented and energetic immigrants from every conceivable corner of the planet. Why not make it easier for the best and brightest from around the world to come here to study? If they stay, we've got outstanding new citizens. And if sooner or later they return to the country from whence they originated, we have lifelong friends individuals likely to take leadership roles in their countries, potential trading partners, or political allies. Just as cultural diversity and economic diversification are such positive developments, so also do we need a diversified system of higher education. Our acute need for knowledge workers isn't confined to the output of graduate schools. We as a province and as a nation still don't have a comprehensive systems-based approach to apprenticeships, colleges, and universities. I'm here to champion research-intensive universities from Dalhousie to UBC, but let's not lose sight of the fact that without outstanding community colleges, without primarily undergraduate universities, without comprehensive universities that have a greater or lesser vocational focus, we can't meet the needs of society. For that matter, without a better system, we may be unable to meet the educational aspirations of the current younger generation. U of T professor David Foote has forewarned that Canada's post-secondary institutions face massive enrollment pressures because of the echo generation, the children of the baby boomers. These enrollment pressures may well last only 15 to 20 years, 
but they are intense and they are already being felt everywhere in Canada. Outside of Alberta, I suspect our universities and colleges alike will struggle to respond. In real terms, ladies and gentlemen, Canadian universities on average are now receiving $2,800 less in operating support from the governments per student than was provided at the beginning of the 1990s. At the beginning of the 1980s, Canadian universities actually received $2,000 more per student than their U.S. public counterparts. Today, American governments invest $5,000 more per student than Canadian governments. This is an imbalance that has to be rectified. But there are also disparities inside Canada, and they are affecting Ontario's universities. I worry deeply about our undergraduate experience at the University of Toronto, and I know that other university presidents in Ontario have similar concerns. As one indicator of the fiscal pinch, our student-to-faculty ratio is almost twice as high as the University of Calgary. And you may ask, how can that be the case in the second richest province in the Federation? Are provincial taxes lower than elsewhere? Are we overspending on other programs? Well, Ontario spends roughly at the national average per capita for kindergarten to grade 12. We spend pretty much exactly at the national average for health care. Our provincial taxes are also at the national average, but we are dead last in per capita spending on post-secondary education. And we've lagged other provinces in funding higher education for more than 15 years, so this isn't new. We can't blame any specific government today or immediately yesterday. And yet, per capita spending on both health care and higher education is substantially higher than Ontario in two equalization receiving provinces, Manitoba and Newfoundland. I don't pretend to have a solution to the endless fiscal wrangling that occurs among the provinces or between the provinces and the federal government. But I can tell you this much. Our first year students would have no problem figuring out that those funding numbers don't add up. That aside, I sure hope we can someday get to the point where Canadians can all focus on growing the national pie together instead of fighting over the size of the provincial slices. It does get a bit tiresome. Here in Ontario, of course, the government's reaching higher plan for post-secondary education has been unfolding for the past two years. It will continue for three more years. It's a progressive and praiseworthy plan, but most of the plan hinges on access, on volume enhancements, not quality enhancements. It's a positive set of steps, but it simply cannot close the gap that has accumulated over 15 years in spending between this province and others. So here's a nice irony. At Canada's finest university, I dream of becoming average. Give my colleagues the average per student government funding provided in the other nine provinces and we'll give your kids an undergraduate experience that's competitive with any in the world. I've said before that we need a system of higher education that allows institutions to pursue their different missions with appropriate incentives. These days, however, some skeptics go further. They assert that research and undergraduate education don't really mix. Now, I accept that a University of Toronto undergraduate education isn't right for every smart teenager leaving high school. But for those young women and young men with a critical edge, with a real instinct for innovation and creativity, an undergraduate education at any of Canada's research-intensive universities can be a powerful experience. Three of my colleagues are guests at the head table who exemplify this culture at the University of Toronto, and I want to reintroduce them to you. Professor D Doug Perovic holds the Celestica Chair in Materials for Microelectronics. Thank you for being here, Doug. He is an expert on materials and nanotechnology. Professor Perovic does research on how materials are made and selected for use in products, their development at a molecular level, and their damage and repair. Some of you may remember that after the Columbia shuttle disaster, media around the world consulted Doug about the destruction of the heat tiles on the spacecraft. Six years ago, Doug Perovic led the development of the world's first undergraduate engineering program 
and nanotechnology. And now he's leading a new initiative to launch an even broader nanoscience baccalaureate at the university. He describes the undergraduate students in his nanotechnology program as truly amazing, with an insatiable appetite for learning at the frontiers of science and engineering. And they're also encouraged to engage in research. One fourth year student project involved the study of degradation and failure of surgical instruments used in hospitals. It's already led to new guidelines for materials in those instruments, as well as for proper cleaning and sterilization during their use. And now, Professor Sally Tagliamonti. Sally, thank you for being here. Who, as you've heard, is with the Department of Linguistics at the University of Toronto, where she is undergraduate coordinator. Professor Tagliamonti is a highly respected expert in linguistic variation and its social implications. Recently, she's been studying teen language in Toronto and she's become a magnet for undergraduates interested in community-based research. In the last three years, over 70 undergraduates have helped Sally Tagliamonti by interviewing preteens and teens from various socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds, and they have built up a major body of original data. By the way, if you ever wondered why your teenagers always use words such as like and so, why they always ask questions when they're making statements? <laughs> Professor Tagliamonti is the one to ask. <laughs> Charles Deber is a professor of biochemistry at the University of Toronto and senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children. A fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Charles Deber is a recognized superstar in research on the genetic diseases of childhood as manifested through protein molecules. For seven years, he's taught introductory biochemistry to second-year students at the University of Toronto. His classroom is Convocation Hall, and his audience, some 1,300 students. He works with a microphone in front of a 50-foot PowerPoint screen. Every class is a performance. His students love him. They give him great ratings, and he says that the design and preparation of lectures for the course have made him a better scientist and that's saying something because he's already a very, very fine scientist. Ladies and gentlemen, we know big classes can be a problem, but big classes also allow big numbers of students to meet big thinkers like Charlie Deaver. And there's no place where undergraduates can meet more big thinkers than at this country's research universities. As my three colleagues illustrate, Canada's research-intensive universities continue to offer something very special not just for graduate and professional, professional program students, but for undergraduates as well. Earlier in this talk, I shared with you my concerns about how Canada is approaching the massive changes underway in the world economy. While other countries are infused with a sense of purpose, we seem to be sleepwalking. And when I think about Canadian public policy, the metaphor that comes to mind is architectural. This is an extraordinary country, but inside it, we sometimes build social structures with strong floors and low ceilings. Places where the furniture is functional, but not very original or exciting. And we spread the furniture carefully into every corner of each room based formulaically on square footage, not maximizing the opportunity for creative conversations or even enhancing the view from the windows. It makes for a nice, tidy place, but it doesn't exactly engender ambition or foster innovation. There are other ways to make policy. Just this month, the German government selected three institutions from among its 102 universities as elite schools that will qualify for substantial new funding designed specifically to take them to a higher level. The renowned old University of Heidelberg was not chosen as one of the three, but Professor Peter Hommelhoff, rector of Heidelberg, said in response that most Germans accepted the idea that radical measures were needed to propel them back into proper competition with their rivals in Europe, and especially to compete with the United States. And Wolfgang Ketterle, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, who was a member of the selection committee, commented, and I quote, Germany was never a flat landscape. There were always hills and valleys. Our hope 
is that some of these hills will now grow into well-defined mountains. In last month's Globe and Mail report card on Canadian universities, Alex Usher of the Educational Policy Institute wrote about the challenges facing those Canadian universities that hope to grow into well-defined mountains. He characterized world-class universities, and I quote, as the wellsprings of the innovative drive that powers modern knowledge economies. Mr. Usher described five Canadian universities as currently world-class. In his view, four of them are serious international competitors in at least one broad field, and one, which I have the privilege to lead, is already competitive across a wide range of disciplines. But Usher also cautioned that for any Canadian institutions to succeed in this intensifying global race for talent and ideas, we too need to make some hard choices and differential investments. That doesn't mean devaluing or discounting institutions that have different missions. Instead, as I commented earlier, it means building a diversified system a real system of higher education that will support a diversified knowledge-based economy. In closing, I would remind you that on January 18, 1904, Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier attended the first annual banquet of the Ottawa Canadian Club. And he said famously, the 19th century was the century of the United States. I think that we can claim that it is Canada that shall fill the 20th century. It's now conventional wisdom to dismiss Laurier's view as naively optimistic, but I'm not so sure. For a young, small nation, we had a remarkable century. Now we have a new century, and before us are new challenges and new opportunities. Canada's research-intensive universities are waiting to help this nation seize those opportunities to raise our ceilings, to move our chairs closer to the windows, to give this great country a wider view of a shrinking world, and above all, to open doors so that our young citizens can go out into that world and change it. Thank you for your time.